Hello, welcome uh, back to my studio. This is our second episode of the mentorship program with uh, Brooke Cormier. So Brooke, welcome back. Thank you. And last week I gave you um, some pretty big challenges about stepping outside of your comfort zone and moving into process mode. Yes. And first of all, before we get into the individual paintings, tell me how that went and how that felt. Well, um, it was definitely very different because I haven't stepped away from high realism, I don't even think ever before, so it was definitely stepping out of my comfort zone and it proved to be a lot more difficult than what I thought. When, yeah. when I was looking through like some of the artists that you gave me, I was like, oh, this should be simple, like, you know, but then I get into it and I'm just like, this is a lot harder than what I <laughs> thought it was going to be. And that's actually what I was really hoping for, um, because it it seems really strange. What we like, because I used to paint very high realism too. That is what people think is really difficult, um, and it's it's it takes a lot of time to achieve those skills. But once you're there, what you're doing is easy because you're just replicating what you see in front of you. And when you're trying to kind of not show it exactly as it is, but twist it kind of bend it or kind of exaggerate, it becomes really difficult because you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's I, I found when I, was in, when I was in process mode, it can be very frustrating. Um, very it can frustrating. be, I said to Diane, I was talking to her this morning, it's like that, have you ever had those dreams where you're kind of late for school and you're lost and you don't know how to get there? That's what it feels like. Yeah, um, really. And that is so, so stressful when you're used to knowing, well, I do this, then I do this, then I do that. Yeah. Um, and so that's a big thing I want to get across to other artists out there, that when you step outside of your comfort zone, it's very uncomfortable, right? Yes. And I'm sure, there was, I'm sure there was a thought that, oh, I can't wait to get, I would love to just scurry back and do what I do. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a tendency that we all have. And unfortunately, most artists do that and then we run into that situation where 20 years from now their paintings are exactly the same um, so that's the thing i want to get across to everybody that it is very difficult and very uncomfortable um, working in process mode but it's a necessary thing you just have to do it yes okay so now now that we've kind of covered that let's get in to your actual paintings so this was the first one that you did and this was kind of uh, looking at Marshall Noyce's work and, and going from there. So tell me a little bit about how this painting went and what you felt while you are doing it. Well, um, for Thanksgiving weekend, I went to my cottage and I was taking a lot of photos. And so when I was first starting to do Marshall Noyce, I was just kind of going through all of my photos and kind of seeing, I was wanting to do like fall kind of colors and that kind of thing. And then I kind of was just kept looking at all of his stuff online and trying to, you know, see the filter that he sees yep. the world through and, and that kind of thing. And so, yeah, I kind of tried to, I tried to um, also incorporate like all the design mm -hmm. principles and everything. Um, I think, <coughs> I think I... I don't know. I, I don't especially like this painting, but I think it's because I'm not a huge fan of Marshall Noyce's style either. So yep. I feel like I wasn't super excited about this one so much. So, yeah. Well, yeah, and you did a good job of, and, and again, that's the important thing when you do this is, again, whether the painting turns out or not, it's doing the, the painting. Mm -hmm. um, because that, what we talked about earlier, one of the things that you need to discover on this journey to finding your own voice is what you really like and what you don't like. And you don't know till you try it. Yeah. So it's kind of like if you go in and you, you do this and you go, I just really don't like painting this way. That's good because that's kind of one thing you can kind of check off the box that this, is, this doesn't really interest me. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes what happens is this doesn't really interest me right now. And it might five years later, all of a sudden, interest you more or whatever or it may not mm -hmm. um but you did a good job of 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 breaking this up into shapes and that's what he does but it's really difficult isn't it his work looks so simple yeah, and, that's and it looks have. so easy um and it's not it's very difficult to paint really really simply like that and yet still have a painting come out that's that's engaging and that and that's that's worthy of painting yeah um 
So that was good. The one thing actually I, I like about here that I see starting to happen. So the problem with some of these shapes, so this big red shape here is it's pretty much the same uh, color, intensity and value all the way through. Mm -hmm. And so that makes the shape kind of less interesting. But I like what you've done here where the, this shape, even though it's all one shape, it changes in color, it changes in intensity, and it changes in value, the light and dark. And so that's one thing if, if anybody out there is interested in painting in these big shapes is to have gradations in both value, intensity, and hue within the shape. Um, and I can see you, you did it, but I can see probably tell you just said, I've had enough of this. Yeah. Right? It's like, <laughs> and that's the thing too. It's like, sometimes it's time to stop beating a dead horse. If yeah. you're not into it, it's like move on to the next painting. Yeah. Let me just let Marley in here. There you go. I also found that I was having a bit of a hard time because I was using acrylics and yeah. it seems like for a lot of these artists, they were using oils and could really layer on the paint and everything. Yeah. But I don't have a lot of paint yeah. at home. <laughs> and I also don't have any oils. So yeah. it was kind of hard to like put a lot of paint on the canvas. So I'm just kind of like going over and layering and layering. Well, the nice thing about oil soon, if you look at Marshall Noyce's stuff, I can see he paints it almost like watercolor. He paints it thin with the yeah. white of the canvas, but it's oil. So he has three days to blend. Yeah. So, <laughs> and that's something we're going to get you into the oils later on, probably not too far from now. Yeah. Um, and for certain things that definitely works better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the next one. Well, these are also, and then I thought, oh, like Marshall Noyce is so simple that I thought, you know, maybe I'll do a few like little ones, but I just got so frustrated with yeah. these, especially like here. I was just like, you know what? I give up. Like <laughs> I didn't even want to bring these in. No, I was... <laughs> I'm glad you did though, because yeah. it's like, these look horrible, yeah, um, really but bad. you are really, really talented. <laughs> Um, and that's the point that, you know, when you're in process, like you do this and you think, oh my God, this looks like a second grader did it. Yeah, really. um, but that's what happens in process and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And again, this is the, t this is the type of thing that sends people scurrying back to their comfort zone. And so you just have to do it. It's part of the process. You're supposed to have some turnout horrible. I'm glad you actually had some turnout horrible uh, because you know, that, that, you know, the first one is still okay. And you can see that it's kind of after martial noise and you know, um, but yeah, this is not good. Um, and that's good. Yeah. That shows you're really pushing. And um, again, it's just, you just got to stay there and fight and fight and fight. Um, at least for a certain time, we, you don't want to spend the rest of your life in process mode because yeah. then you would probably throw your brushes down and disgust and walk yeah. away. But that's good. I'm glad these two didn't turn out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's look at the next one. And next I did Van Gogh and yeah, this was another one, another photo that I based it on that I took at my cottage at mm -hmm. Boschkan Lake. And, um, what I liked about the photo especially was the reflection on the water. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I kind of tried to do, um, Van Gogh's like small brush strokes, which is also something I've never done before. Yeah. So I enjoyed, I definitely enjoyed painting this one more than the other ones, <laughs> the martial noise, but it's, it's also like not my favorite of the week. Yeah. And there's some things that actually turned out really good here. Um, in particular, what I really like, and so I mentioned about the brushwork of Van Gogh. Um, and what I really like is the handling of the foreground here, because what he does is his brushworks follows the form. And here in particular, those, those curvy lines that follow the, the bushes, that really works well. And same with up in here. Um, what probably would have made this a little better is if you had more of that up here in the sky, the mm -hmm. fact that we have almost all horizontal brush strokes here and then very strict horizontal brush strokes here, kind of, it, it, it's kind of fighting with this kind of free form mm -hmm. falling. So if, the, if we had it more following, if you think of Starry Nights, you know how it, it just, the, the brush strokes follow that whole shape. Yeah. Hey, Marley, what are you doing? <laughs> but this turned out good. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, for having never kind of painted with the broken color, um, it worked out fairly nicely. Um, the other thing that I would say, whenever you're doing the sparkle on the water, 
and I can see you've done little bits of other color in there. It generally works better when you put more color, like not just have white as yes. the sparkles. Yes. If some of these, if you had um, coming towards where the light is, if you think about, so the basic color of the water is blue. If we warm up the blue and get lighter as we come in here, so that means maybe some, some greens heading towards that side of the color wheel and then heading towards the magenta side with some pinks. So mm -hmm. if you had some pinks and some greens in here as we go, it would just be more interesting because mm -hmm. it's this is the one area here um, where there's not much color variation. Yeah. It's, all, it's just in value. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but no, all in all, yeah, it turned out, <laughs> it turned out, it turned out good. I mean, uh, uh, again, I mean, it's not your greatest piece, um, but I don't expect anything in, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't expect any piece that you start, this is going to be the best painting you've done. Um, but I expect at some point that will happen. Mm -hmm. And and so that's the thing. Or not only not only do the best painting you've done, but you may say, you know what? I really like this. And so when I go into doing um, back in product mode, where you're just using skills, concepts, techniques you feel competent and confident in, you may find some of these techniques all of a sudden where you go, you know what, that would look good in this painting. And so you're mm -hmm. just constantly just trying to add to your skill set. Um, but no, that one turned out pretty well. I can see you didn't have too much trouble figuring out the filter yeah. and then applying it yeah. to, to your scene. I think that was probably the easiest filter yeah. for me to figure out. And then next I did Larissa Ocon. And I think that I was least successful in these ones um, in regards to actually copying her style. Yeah. Because I think that when you look at this, you wouldn't even see that it was Larissa Ocon. But I had the hardest time, I think, with her actually copying her style for some reason. I just so I couldn't grasp it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and again, that's the other important thing. The, the important thing is not that at the end of the day your work looks like it was, it was kind of um, inspired by her or influenced by her. The important thing is just to try different approaches mm -hmm. uh, and then you get what you get, right? I actually like all three of these little paintings. I really love this little one. Mm -hmm. Um, and it in the photograph, like this, if this was 24 by 24 would be breathtaking. I have a lot of photos of this cause I really like that. And I like, so what I really like with this piece here too, actually with all of these pieces is it's, it's kind of more heading towards representational, like your other work, but your brushwork is. Mm -hmm. It like, so there's a difference between surface and image. Um, so when we look at your real high real realism stuff and say like the portrait of the, the fire dog, you know, we don't even see the hand of the artist much in there. We're not, mm -hmm. we're, we're just seeing the image of the dog. And then if we look at a total abstract or just at the pal at a palette of paint, we don't see an image. We just see the surface of the paint. And here is where we're combining the, them both. We see the image of these flowers, but we also see the surface of the paint. And I like the fact that you've suggested a lot of things in one or two brush strokes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you get it right, that just has a real beauty to it. That's much nicer than if you got in there with the one hairbrush. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and actually for all of these, I see that. Mm -hmm. um, and I like it actually. The, actually all three of these are really nice little paintings. Um, and, and even here too, the fact that, you know, even though these are kind of flat backgrounds, there's still, we can see the surface of the paint in there and that mm -hmm. it's, that it's a painting. Um, but I really like, uh, that little one there. When I got, saw that image, it's like, wow, like that deserves to be a big painting. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem you'll find, um, when you're used to working small is when you scale up and work big, you, to get the same feel, you have to scale up and brush and brush stroke size. So yeah. while you're doing a little stroke here, that's maybe three quarters of an inch long and you know, three sixteenths wide. When you go to a two by two painting, that stroke needs to be an inch and a half wide and yeah. three inches long. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a difficult thing. And that's, that's something that we'll, we'll work towards. But this little piece here uh, in particular is really, really strong. Uh, yeah. The composition is, is amazing. The, the, the colors, um, but yeah, I really like that. I actually, I like all three of these. 
Yeah, I did that one first, and then the flowers. Was, yeah, the flowers, and then I was starting another one, and I hated it, and I painted over it, and then I was like, you know what? I just grabbed some fruit from in the kitchen, and I got my <laughs> camera, and I was like, I'm doing a still life. <laughs> well, that's great though, and I. But the thing is, I can see you really played with the brushwork. Right yeah. too, and and that's the thing. Like I think you mentioned that last time. Like a subject of a painting does not have to be the spectacular landscape. Right, often simple things that are done with you know strong light effect um, and interesting brushwork can turn out nice. Actually, all all three of these are uh, what I would say little sellable paintings. So good to know. Which is a good thing. <laughs> so and the next one that you did was we were looking at Tom Thompson. Yes. So uh, I took your advice and I redid this one that I took in Algonquin. Yeah. And with this painting, I I like it. However, I think my expectations were for it to be more colorful and it just turned out a lot more gray and like more <laughs> monotone than I wanted. Um, but I experimented a little bit and went out of my comfort zone with using a palette knife. Yeah. And I found that I actually really liked it, like the sky and everything. The sky here is spectacular. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed doing the sky and then and getting a lot of texture in there. And that's what I was kind of um, focused on in this one. But I I actually, I really like this one. I saw the image actually and I showed Diane and we both said, wow. So like it, it showed small, it showed really good. And I said, okay, well, I want to see it kind of bigger. Um, and I, I, I still really like it. Um, the fact that, that it turned out, you hope to have more color, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that's what happens too. The painting is an organic process. Sometimes you want to go right and the painting goes left. Um, I remember when I was watching Zoltan Zabo paint and he said, I'm going to put a bush down here. And then like part way into it, he said, that doesn't want to be a bush. It wants to be a rock. Yeah. And so you could try to make it a horrible bush you know, <laughs> or just let it be a rock and be a great rock. So yeah. sometimes, um, and I think I said that to you um, afterwards, because I know you said you you were, you had hoped that this was going to be one thing and you're kind of disappointed with how it turned out. Um, and that's when we're painting, we always have in our minds eye what we're going for. And when it turns out to be anything other than what we were going for, we look at that as wrong and as a disappointment. Mm -hmm. But sometimes what you get is as good or better than what you were going for and you need to kind of put stuff away sometimes and look at it with a fresh eye the next morning and what i like to say sometimes i i'd be working on a piece and figure i still have maybe two or three hours left to finish it mm -hmm. uh, and then i'll get up in the morning and look at it and it's like the little elves came out and finished it because there's nothing that it needs and so looking with fresh eyes is really important mm -hmm. um, and again that whole idea of of just you know, so tell me what you're not happy about with this, first of all, this. Um, I think that when I, when I was starting, I had in mind this kind of color scheme and I really wanted to get some like reds in there and some, some like fall colors yeah. in that. And then once I started putting those colors on the canvas, I was saying, oh, like if that doesn't look good. And then I kind of like put some more like different colors on top. And then I was like, oh, am I overworking this right now? Like, I don't know. But um, yeah, I think that like my favorite part of it is definitely the sky, but- Actually the water is really, yeah, really good too. Yeah, I, I used a palette knife for, I did the sky and the water first with the palette knife and then I did like this. And then that's, you probably get, that's when you get kind of that real kind of fear anxiety because you've got like a gorgeous sky going, yeah. you've got gorgeous <laughs> water going and then you're like, okay, now all I got to do is not screw it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and you didn't. Um, and so what I was going to, uh, and I'm sure too, what happened when you start putting reds in there, it disrupts the unity of the painting mm -hmm. because the, like, again, it's like you think of that Sesame street thing. One of these things doesn't belong. It's mm -hmm. not like the other. So that has to do with both color value brush where kind of every component of the painting has to look like it belongs with the rest. And if you came in here with some really strong color, it would just be too glaring of a, a jarring of a color note. Um, so it would disrupt the unity. Um, and again, sometimes you just got to go with what you got. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really like this piece. I mean, I think the, the sky is definitely the strongest, probably this area in here probably gave you the most trouble, did it? Yeah. And that's where it looks like you've gone in and, and kind of reworked it a little. Um, so, I mean, 
did this painting come to its, you know, 100% of its potential? No. Um, but the good thing is, like, if you've got a really good, strong composition, good use of color, and, like, your drawing is good, like, everything like that, if you get it 85% right, it's a winner. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the big thing to realize is at a, accept 85% and say this is a winner and put it aside um, and the things that kind of didn't work out as good as you hoped then focus that on the next painting because what often happens is people then go back in and they go and then they end up turning it not 85 then it turns into it starts looking not as good as it did yeah. five minutes ago yeah. and the next thing you know you've ruined it so often you know I rarely, I maybe have one or two paintings a year, maybe not even that, where at the end of the day, everything turned out exactly I'm happy with. Mm -hmm. um, there's always things that I know I could have done that a little better, but I would have had to do it better the first time. Mm -hmm. I can't go back in and make it better. I'm just going to make it worse. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's a really good example of this here. This, this piece is a winner. I don't think you'll have this one for too long. Um, really good example too though of the unity that you don't have to have bright color right because there's not a lot of um, color in here but what I do like kind of a, throughout this whole thing um, Edgar Whitney used to say you know don't go a square inch without a change in color value or texture so even though this is almost all in grays the fact that there's such variety in the grays from yellows to greens to reds to blues um, to even oranges the fact that the grays are colorful makes it work. And it, this is not a boring color palette. It's, actually, I really like it. I say this was the one piece, two, one of two pieces that, that got a wow out of me when I saw it on my phone. Yeah. Okay, and let's go to the last one. All right. And Brian Rutenberg, I left for last, and this is what I got. <laughs> how did you, so first of all, how did you find working on this piece? Well... I don't think I've ever done anything so abstract before. Um, I was really excited for this one because I knew that I would be working with a very diverse color palette, which yep. I was excited about since the last painting I didn't get all those <laughs> colors in, so I was like, I'm going to take advantage of this. Um, and yeah, so how I went about doing this, because I he's got so many YouTube videos and I yep. was just kind of, I was looking through all of his work and then watching like video after video. and. And he's saying like, oh, he goes in and he doesn't, you know, he never knows. He doesn't have a plan. He just yeah, does it. So I'm like, he's totally organic. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to have a plan, <laughs> but I'm also like, yeah. So I kind of did a background a gradation kind of thing and then scrapped that and then did some other stuff and just kind of layered the paint on. And, and I was looking at like his stuff too, because I noticed like his theme of kind of like blurring the colors yep. for the like central part. So obviously I try I, to I like too. it. I can tell right away that, but it's, it's, again, it's so neat when you try to look at someone else's kind of style and then interpret it yourself. Definitely his use of color. Mm -hmm. You've really done. And I, and that's one of the things I love about his work is, is that kind of boldness of putting like a chartreuse right down next to a bold violet and an orange. Uh, but then he also spends a lot of time in these kind of grayed down colors and those grayed colors next to the bright ones mm -hmm. creates a real vibration. Um, and, and the brushwork itself, um, although this looks very abstract, like did you go from anything or was this just totally out of your mind? This was totally out of my mind. Okay, good. I didn't, yep. I didn't even know what to go from, yep. so I kind of like... And that's hard. Yeah. Painting pure abstract. I kind of like picked where I wanted like the central kind of area to be. Yeah. And then thought about lines. And, you know, he says that like his stuff is kind of like very loosely based off of yep. nature. So I was kind of thinking about like this says being kind of like a tree shape almost. But and well, then this is these kind of like lines coming into like trying to, I don't know. That, but well, this is, I would say, even more abstract than his work. Mm -hmm. because I don't see any relation to reality in there. But I actually really like this. And this is a really, really strong composition um, and co colorful, but not too colorful. Like I like the fact that, you know, okay, you've gone with some really intense uh, notes of bright, intense color, but then you've also got grayed down areas and darks that are almost blacks. Um, and there is kind of a whole... Kind of, this is almost like the wagon wheel 
um, type compositional plan where the eye is drawn in here because all of this movement, these are all like spokes of the wheel drawing the eye in, but then also this area kind of shouts at us mm -hmm. because it's, uh, again, the most bright, intense color. And we've got the most intense color contrast you can get is yellow against purple. And you've got bright, intense yellows against kind of mid-range or, or slightly dark purples. So that really draws the eye. And that puts up a bit of a tension, too, that, that our eye wants to go here because everything is leading there. But then it wants to come back here um, because of those bright, intense color notes and the contrast. And that creates movement. Like when you look at this piece, your eye can't help but moving around the canvas. And that's ideally what we want. Mm -hmm. that, you know, that's how you can, you can always tell a great painting. Um, if you go, if you go to like a jury show or go to a museum, when people are standing in front of the painting for five minutes and their eyes are just dancing with everything the art has done, their eyes are moving around. You can't just look at it and kind of mm -hmm. go, oh, I get and walk away. It just draws you in. And this does that. Yeah, um, I was kind of worried actually that this might be too distracting because I wanted this to be like the really like central part of the painting. But I think I guess well, it's you a can good have thing. so you so you don't have to have like again the rules are meant to be broken, right? So the the, the rules that are there are there because generally it's like if you do this, it causes the viewer's eye to do that, and if that's a bad thing, then it's bad. But if it's not a bad thing, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. And so you do have two areas of competing interest here. I think this one ends up winning. Um, but uh, again, if this was much more contrasted or had bright, intense color here, then that'd be a problem. Because yeah. then they're both shouting just as loudly. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the movement of the painting wants to draw our right eye here. But then the, the color and value contrast wants to draw right here. Um, and at the end of the day, this one shouts the loudest. So we end up coming, but then we always end, we keep coming back, back to there. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I mean, if you have, you could have had this, you know, where, you know, either this or this was just shouting so loudly, look at me. But then what you get is a static composition where the eye just goes zoom right into there yeah. and stops. Uh, so I think, I think this one was successful. I really like it. The colors themselves, the color palette, I, you, I, I can really see his influence there. And I, I don't know about you, but I love his use of color mm -hmm. and it's hard, right? It's working with bright, intense color yeah. is really hard not to make it look like a mishmash of everything. And so you have to be selective about where you're going to use that bright, intense color. Um, and yeah, I like this piece. Yeah. So it was also hard because Again, I didn't have a lot of paint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in his videos, he squeezes out tubes and he's got his gloves he's got, and he's, he's got piles of paint around. this big. He's yeah. just smearing it on. I'm like, I don't have that. <laughs> so, and you know, working with the cardboard instead yeah. of like a palette knife. And I'm trying to do that, but I don't. Have that. So, considering the fact you were using a little bit of paint and brushes, I think that that turned out really well. Um, okay, so just kind of your final thoughts on kind of the whole kind of how you found this last week. What did you, what did you like the most? What did you not like the most? And which piece was your favorite? Well, I was definitely not expecting it for it to be so difficult. <laughs> and when I jumped into this, I'm like, oh, you know, like this is something new, but it'll be fun. And I didn't expect <clears throat> myself to be so frustrated over some of the, the painting. So, I guess I obviously didn't like being frustrated, but I had to keep reminding myself that it's part of the process. Um, what I did like about it was, was stepping out of my comfort zone and getting away from high realism mm -hmm. and kind of, yeah, putting away my tiny little brushes for a little bit and, and using broader brushes. Um, my favorite painting is probably the Rutenberg one. Mm -hmm. Or I even like my my apple and banana. Yeah, you know? I like those two. They turned yeah, out like, there's something really sweet and just cute about them. But it's like, yeah, it's like kind of short to the point, yeah. but done really well. Yeah, so I think that those three were kind of battling for my favorite. Least favorite, probably the noise one. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and yeah, that's it. And because what we what we're searching for at the end of the day is so the whole kind of 
point of this process is for you to get to a point where you can create great works with your own unique voice. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of finding, well, how do you find that? Um, but then what you also have to find, you have to be able to do that, but there also has to be three other things that happen is you need to love the process. You need to love the finished paintings and a certain amount of the public needs to love the certain paintings. So you could find yourself in a situation where you do paintings that at the end of the day, you love the painting and the public loves the painting, but you'd rather have root canal than do that eight hours a day, yeah. you know? And so then that, that doesn't work. So that's part of this process as well is not only kind of, kind of exposing you to different things in terms of to expand your skill set. But it's also for you kind of ex ex exposing yourself to different approaches that you think, oh, I might like to try that or I might like to try that, but not so much or fit it into the way that you paint. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the take on last week. So you have a small show coming up, right? Yes, on the 30th. On the 30th. And that's at uh, the White Little Golf Course. They're having a craft. Yep, a little art day, little, show. So I've got my show. table. I guess it's kind of my first little art show. So. Okay, so that's great. So what I want to talk, we, we touched on this briefly kind of after the last episode is pricing mm -hmm. and how you go about pricing your work. And that's a really, really difficult thing for a lot of people to do. And so what I, I just want to talk a little bit about this, and I know you've already heard this, but this is more for, for the people that are watching, that when you're pricing your work, there's two things you have to consider, is the price and the value. And you get to set the price, and the public or the market gets to set the value. And when people start, one of the things that I find that, that, that I find a lot of people get discouraged, they start painting, and then three months later, they decide they're, you know, they join a craft guild or whatever, and they're having the show and it's like, well, I'm going to put my work in there. Um, when they've been painting for three months or four months or a year, and then they get all discouraged when nobody buys their work. Um, and that's because, you know, people think because they've done a painting that it's a product that has a value. Um, and it does have a value, but when we start off, often that's a negative value. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's where people would not hang your work even if you gave it to them for free. And so those, especially those two that really didn't turn out to you, they have a negative value. You know, you could, yeah. you could, you could put five cents on it for price tag and no one's going to pick it up. You could yeah. say, I'll pay you $5 to hang it in your house. <laughs> no one's no. going to hang it. <laughs> so you have to be, when you start selling your work, cognizant of what is the value that the public puts on it. And it has nothing to do with how long it took you. People don't care. You could spend 30 hours on a horrible painting. No one is going to hang it. It all has to do with when people view the painting, does it engage them and do they feel the feeling of, oh, I'd like to have that and have it in my house so that when I look at it every day, it's going to give me that same sort of feeling. And so, uh, again, the, the value is what the public puts on it or the market. So... So one thing that's a, an effective way to gauge where you should be pricing your work is if you can go out and either to other art shows, local festivals, whatever, um, and try and find somebody where you would say, okay, well, their work is kind of comparable to mine in terms of, you know, the quality of the work, the size of the work, um, and also where that person is in their career. So you don't want to go out and look and go, oh, gee, Brian Rutenberg is charging $20,000 for an 18 by 14 abstract. So that's what abstracts go for. And I've actually had people do that to me. They Absolute beginners have asked me what I charge for a 30 by 40 and then go, oh, well, that's what I'm charging too. I can't figure it out. I'm not selling. And it's like, even if, it, even if the work was as good, which, which it wasn't, but even if it was as good, your kind of CV, your, 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 your biography of where you've been and what you've done is an important part of determining price. Um, so what I often say is kind of look at where you think your work would be kind of comparable to someone else. And then the very first time you go out, undercut that. Mm -hmm. uh, because if someone else goes, well, I really like this and I really like this and they're both comparable, but this one's 10% cheaper and I like them both as much then that's what you're, that person's going to buy that piece. Um, and especially when you're starting out, it's better to sell more for less um, than to try and get the absolute most out of each piece. Because, because it's, it's a constantly evolving process and your work is going to be changing, right now these pieces, um, you can sell them 
Um, and, and because you're in this, this kind of uh, process mode of, of trying to find your voice, you know, people understand why there's a lot of difference in your work. But if you have these pieces a year from now, and you've kind of honed in on more of this is what I do, all of a sudden, not only can't you even sell these pieces, you can't show them yeah. because it's going to be confusing to people because they're all going to, they're already going to start to say, well, Brooke Cormier does this. And what's this apple or this, this <laughs> banana doing here or this Tom Thompson like landscape. Yeah. So you always want to, I always kind of would rather if, if so you have value and you have price. If you have your work priced just slightly above value, you probably won't sell anything, or you might sell one or two. If you have it priced under the value, there's a good chance you'll sell out. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, prices always go up. It's, you never want your prices to go down um, because you're basically then betraying your clients. If somebody has spent you know, $100 on whatever size piece and you said that's the price, and then they come back three months later and you're selling that size piece for $80. Well, you've devalued their piece that they've bought. Mm -hmm. So you always want to start out underpricing um, and then go up. And you can actually raise your prices literally overnight. The very first show, the first really big show that I did, the Toronto Art Expo, I, I knew that I had to make my booth fee back and it was a lot of money. It was like $3,000 to do the show. Um, and so I had my prices very aggressively priced to sell. Uh, and the first day we did amazing. The second day I bumped everything back up 15%. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can, you can do that. Um, but it's a much better feeling to sell lots or sell out yeah. uh, than to sell none. <laughs> and so that's, that's how I would um, kind of suggest you go about the pricing. All right. um, and so that's, so you have the show coming up in just over two weeks, under two weeks. Yes. On October 30th, okay. which is Sunday. So, and so I'm assuming what you want to do and what I would suggest you do now is from now till the show is just paint what you want, mm -hmm. the way you want, um, trying to do the best paintings you can and thinking in terms of putting them in, in for this sale. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. And so what, okay. if, what I'm going to be interested to see is whether any of that this stuff kind of creeps in yeah um, and it may or it may not and you just need to kind of let it happen mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah so this this will be nice too after this uh, week of stressfully not knowing where you're going yeah. and flying by the seat of your pants you can go back to your comfort zone and just produce the best pieces you can okay okay yeah okay well thanks for joining us uh, again and uh, we'll see you next time